Section 2 of Astounding Stories 05, May 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories 05, May 1930. Into the Ocean's Depths by Sewell Peasley Wright. Part 2. In the day following, the Santa Maria was launched. Two days later, trial trips and final adjustments completed, we submerged for the great adventure. It sounds very simple when recorded thus in a few brief lines. It was not, however, such a simple matter. Those three days were full of hectic activity. Mercer and I did not sleep more than four hours any of those three nights. We were too busy to talk. Mercer worked frantically in his laboratory, slaving feverishly beside the big hood. I overlooked the tests of the submarine and the loading of the necessary supplies. The girl we had taken back to her parents, giving her to understand that she was to wait. They went away, but every few hours returned, as though to urge us to greater haste. And at last we were ready, and the girl and her two companions seated themselves on the tiny deck of the Santa Maria, just forward of the conning tower, holding themselves in place by the chains. We had already instructed the girl in her duties. We would move slowly, and she should guide us by pointing either to the right or to the left. I will confess I gave a last long lingering look at the shore before the hatch of the conning tower was clamped down. I was not exactly afraid, but I wondered if I would ever step foot on solid land again. Standing in the conning tower beside Mercer, I watched the sea rise at an angle to meet us, and I dodged instinctively as the first green wave pelted against the thick porthole through which I was looking. An instant later, the water closed over the top of the conning tower, and at a gentle angle we nosed toward the bottom of the sea. An account of the trip itself perhaps does not belong in this record. It was not a pleasant adventure in itself, for the Santa Maria, like every undersea craft, I suppose, was close, smelly, and cramped. We proceeded very slowly, for only by so doing could our guide keep her bearings, and how she found the way was a mystery to all of us. We could see but very little, despite the clearness of the water. It was by no means a sightseeing trip. For various reasons, Mercer had cut our crew to the minimum. We had two navigating officers, experienced submarine men both, and five sailors, also experienced in undersea work. With such a short crew, Mercer and I were both kept busy. Bonnet, the captain, was a tall, dark chap, stooped from years in the low, cramped quarters of submarines. Duke, our second officer, was a youngster hardly out of his teens, and as clever as they come. And although both of them, and the crew as well, must have been agog with questions, neither by word nor look did they express their feelings. Mercer had paid for obedience without curiosity, and he got it. We spent the first night on the bottom, for the simple reason that had we come to the surface, we might have come down into territory unfamiliar to our guide. And as soon as the first faint light began to filter down, however, we proceeded, and Mercer and I crowded together in the conning tower. We're close, said Mercer. See how excited they are, all three of them? The three strange creatures were holding on to the chains and staring over the bulging side of the ship. Every few seconds the girl turned and looked back at us, smiling, her eyes shining with excitement. Suddenly she pointed straight down and held out her arm in an unmistakable gesture. We were to stop. Mercer conveyed the order instantly to Bonnet at the controls, and all three of our guides dived gracefully off the ship and disappeared into the depths below. Let her settle to the bottom, Bonnet, ordered Mercer. Slowly, slowly. Bonnet handled the ship neatly, keeping her nicely trimmed. We came to rest on the bottom in four or five seconds, and as Mercer and I stared out eagerly through the round glass ports of the conning tower, we could see very dimly a cluster of dark, rounded projections cropping out from the bed of the ocean. We were only a few yards from the edge of the girl's village. The scene was exactly as we had pictured it, 
save that it was not nearly as clear and well lighted. I realized that our eyes were not accustomed to the gloom as were those of the girl and her people, but I could distinguish the vague outlines of the houses and the slowly swaying shapes of monstrous growths. Well, Taylor, said Mercer, his voice shaking with excitement, here we are, and here, peering out through the glass-covered port again, are her people. The whole village was swarming around us. White bodies hovered around us as moths around a light. Faces pressed against the ports and stared in at us with great amazed eyes. And then suddenly the crowd of curious creatures parted, and the girl came darting up with the five ancients she had showed us before. They were evidently the council responsible for the government of the village, or something of the sort, for the other villagers bowed their heads respectfully as they passed. The girl came close to the port through which I was looking, and gestured earnestly. Her face was tense and anxious, and from time to time she glanced over her shoulder as though she feared the coming of an enemy. Our time's short, I take it, if we're to be of service, said Mercer. Come on, Taylor, into the diving suits. I signaled the girl that we understood and would hurry. Then I followed Mercer into our tiny stateroom. Remember what I've told you, he said, as we slipped into the heavy woolen undergarments we were to wear inside the suits. You understand how to handle your air, I believe, and you'll have no difficulty getting around in the suit if you'll just remember to go slowly. Your job is to get the whole village to get away when the enemy is sighted. Get them to come this way from the village towards the ship. Understand? The current comes from this direction. The way the vegetation bends shows that. And keep the girl's people away until I signal you to let them return. And remember to take your electric lantern. Don't burn it more than is necessary. The batteries are not large, and the bulb draws a lot of current. Ready? I was. But I was shaking a little as the men helped me into the mighty armor that was to keep the pressure of several atmospheres from crushing my body. The helmet was the last piece to be donned. When it was screwed in place, I stood there like a mummy, almost completely rigid. Quickly we were put into the airlock, together with a large iron box containing a number of things Mercer needed. Darkness and water rushed in on us. The water closed over my head. I became aware of the soft, continuous popping sounds of the air bubbles escaping from the relief valve of the headpiece. For a moment I was dizzy, and more than a little nauseated. I could feel the cold sweat pricking my forehead. Then there was a sudden glow of light from before me, and I started walking towards it. I found I could walk now, not easily, but after I caught the trick of it, without much difficulty, I could move my arms too and the interlocking hooks that served me for fingers. When my real fingers closed over a little crossbar at the end of the armored arms and pulled the bars toward me, the steel claws outside came together like a thumb and two fingers. In a moment we stood upon the bottom of the ocean. I turned my head inside the helmet, and there beside me was the sleek, smooth side of the Santa Maria. On my other side was Mercer, a huge, dim figure in his diving armor. He made an awkward gesture toward his head, and I suddenly remembered something. Before me, where I could operate it with a thrusting movement of my chin, was a toggle switch. I snapped it over and heard Mercer's voice, and forget everything I tell him. I know it, I said mentally to him. I was rather rattled. Okay now, however, anything I can do. Yes, help me with this box, and then get the girl to put on the antenna you'll find there. Don't forget the knife and the light. Right. I bent over the box with him, and we both came near falling. We opened the lid, however, and I hooked the knife and the light into their proper places outside my armor. Then with the antenna for the girl, so that we could establish connections with her and through her with the villagers, I moved off. This antenna was entirely different from the one used in previous experiments. The four cross members that clasped the head were finer and at their junction was a flat, black, circular box, from which rose a black rod some six inches in height, and topped by a black sphere half the size of my fist. These perfected thought telegraphs, I shall continue to use my own designation for them, as clearer and more understandable than Mercer's, did not need connecting wires. 
They conveyed their impulses by Hertzian waves to a master receiver on the Santa Maria, which amplified them and rebroadcast them so that each of us could both send and receive at any time. As I turned, I found the girl beside me waiting anxiously. Behind her were the five ancients. I slipped the antenna over her head, and instantly she began telling me that danger was imminent. To facilitate matters, I shall describe her messages as though she spoke. Indeed, her pictures were as clear almost as speech in my native tongue, and at times she did use certain sound words. It was in this way that I learned by inference that her name was Imee, and that her people were called Timorn. This may have been the name of the community, or perhaps it was interchangeable, I'm not sure, and that the shark-faced people were the Rorn. The Rorn come, she said quickly. Two days passed. The three came again, and our old men refused to give up the slaves. Today they will return these Rorn, and my people, the Timorn, will all be made dead. Then I told her what Mercer had said that she and every one of her people must flee swiftly and hide beyond the boat, a distance beyond the village. Mercer and I would wait here, and when the Rorn came, it was they who would be made dead, as we had promised. Although how I admitted to myself being careful to hide the thought that she might sense it, I didn't know. We had been too busy since the girl's arrival to go into details. She turned and spoke quickly to the old men. They looked at me doubtfully, and she urged them vehemently. They turned back towards the village, and in a moment the Timorn was stalking by, obediently, losing their slim white forms in the gloom behind the dim bulk of the Santa Maria resting so quietly on the sand. They were hardly out of sight when suddenly Mercer spoke through the antenna fitted inside my helmet. They're coming, he cried. Look above and to your right. The Rorn, as Imee calls them, have arrived. I looked up and beheld a hundred, no, a thousand shadowy forms darting down on the village upon us. They too were just as the girl had pictured them, short, swart beings with but the suggestion of a nose and with pulsing gill covers under the angles of their jaws. Each one gripped a long, slim white knife in either hand, and their tight-fitting shark-skin armor gleamed darkly as they swooped down upon us. Eagerly I watched my friend. In the glasping talons of his left hand he held a long, slim flask that glinted even in that dim, confusing twilight. Two others, mates to the first, dangled at his waist. Lifting it high above his head, he swung his metal-clad right arm and shattered the flask he held in his taloned left hand. For an instant nothing happened, save that flittering bits of broken glass shimmered their way to the sand. Then the horde of noseless ones seemed to dissolve as hundreds of limp and sprawling bodies sank to the sand. Perhaps a half of that great multitude seemed struck dead. Hydrocyanic acid, Taylor, cried Mercer exultantly. Even diluted by seawater, it kills almost instantly. Go back and make sure that none of the girls' people come back before the current has washed this away, or they'll go in the same fashion. Warn her to keep them back. I hurried toward the Santa Maria, thinking urgent warnings for Imee's benefit. Stay back. Stay back, Imee. The Rorn are falling to the sand. We have made many of them dead, but the danger for you and your people is still here. Stay back. Truly, do the Rorn become dead? I would like to see that with my own eyes. Be careful that they do not make you dead also, and your friend, for they have large brains, these Rorn. Do not come to see with your own eyes, or you will be as the Rorn. I heard around the submarine to keep her back by force, if that were necessary. You must help, Taylor, cut in a voice. Mercers, these devils have got me. Right with you. I turned and hurried back as swiftly as I could, stumbling over the bodies of dead Rorn that had settled everywhere on the clean yellow sand. I found Mercer in the grip of six of the shark-faced creatures. They were trying desperately to stab him, but their knives bent and broke against the metal of his armor. So busy were they with him that they did not notice me coming up, but finding their weapons useless, they suddenly snatched him up 
one at either arm and either leg, and two grasping him by the headpiece, and darted away with him, carrying his bulging metal body between them like a battering ram, while he kicked and struggled impotently. They are taking him to the place of darkness, cried Imy suddenly, having read my impressions of the scene. Oh, go quickly, quickly, toward the direction of your best hand. To your right, I shall follow. No, no, stay back, I warned her frantically. All but these six Rorn had fallen victims of Mercer's hellish poison, and while they seemed to be suffering no ill effects, I thought it more than likely that some sly current might bring the deadly poison to the girl did she come this way and kill her as surely as it had killed these hundreds of Rorn. To the right, she had said, towards the place of darkness. I hurried out of the village in the direction she indicated toward the distant gleam of Mercer's armor, rapidly being lost in the gloom. I'm coming, Mercer, I called to him. Delay them as much as you can. You're going faster than I can. I can't help myself much, replied Mercer, doing what I can. Strong, they're devilish strong, Taylor, and at close range I can see you were right. They have true gill covers, their noses are rudimentary, and the devil take your scientific observations. Drag, slow them down. I'm losing sight of you. For heaven's sake, drag. I'm doing what I can, damn you, if I could only get a hand free. I realized that this last was directed at his captors and plunged on. Huge, monstrous growths swirled around me like living things. My feet crunched on shelled things and sank into soft and slimy creeping things on the bottom. I cursed the water that held me back so gently, yet so firmly. I cursed the armor that made it so hard for me to move my legs. But I kept on, and at last I began to gain on them. I could see them quite distinctly, bending over Mercer, working on him. Do your best, Taylor, urged Mercer desperately. We're on the edge of a sort of cliff a fault in the structure of the ocean bed. They're tying me with strong cords of leather, tying a huge stone to my body. I think they... I had a momentary flash of the scene, as Mercer saw it at that instant, the horrid, noseless face close to his, the swart bodies moving with amazing agility, and at his very feet, a yawning precipice holding nothing but darkness, leading down and down into nothingness. Run quickly, it was Imy. She too had seen what I had seen. That is the place of darkness, where we take those whom the five deem worthy of the last punishment. They will tie the stone to him, and bear him out above the blackness, and then they will let him go. Quickly, quickly. I was almost upon them now, and one of the six turned and saw me. Three of them darted towards me, while the others held Mercer flat upon the edge of the precipice. If they had only realized that by rolling his armored body a foot or two, he would sink without the stone. But they did not. Their brains had little reasoning power, apparently. The attaching of a stone was necessary in their experience. It was necessary now. With my left hand, I unhooked my light. I already gripped my knife in my right hand. Swinging the light sharply against my leg, I struck the toggle switch, and the beam of intense brilliancy shot through the gloom. It aided me as I thought it would. It blinded those large-eyed denizens of the deep. Swiftly I struck out with a knife. It hacked harmlessly into the shark-skin garment of one of the men. I stabbed out again. Two of the men leaped for my right arm, but the knife found this time the throat of the third. My beam of light showed palely red for a moment, and the body of the Rorn toppled slowly to the bed of the ocean. The two shark-faced creatures were hammering at me with their fists, dragging at my arms and legs, but I plunged on desperately towards Mercer. Myriads of fish, all shapes and colors and sizes, attracted by the light, swarmed around us. Good boy, Mercer commended. See if you can break this last flask of acid here at my waist. See? With a last desperate plunge, fairly dragging the two Rorn who tugged at me, I fell forward. With the clenched steel talons of my right hand, I struck at the silvery flask I could see dangling from Mercer's waist. I hit it, but only a glancing blow. The flask did not shatter. Again commanded Mercer. It's heavy annealed glass. Hydrocyanic acid. Terrible stuff. Even the fumes. I paid but slight heed. The two Rorn dragged me back, but I managed to crawl forward on my knees, and with all my strength I struck at the flask again. 
This time it shattered, and I lay where I fell, sobbing with weakness, looking out through the side window of my headpiece. The five Rorns seemed to suddenly lose their strength. They struggled limply for a moment, and then floated down to the waiting sand beneath us. Finish, remarked Mercer coolly, and just in time. Let's see if we can find our way back to the Santa Maria. We were weary, and we plodded along slowly, twin trails of air bubbles like plumes waving behind us, rushing upwards to the surface. I felt strangely alone at the moment, isolated, cut off from all mankind on the bottom of the Atlantic. Coming to meet you, all of us, Imee signaled us. Be careful where you step, so that you do not walk in a circle and find again the place of darkness. It is very large. Probably some uncharted deep threw in Mercer. Only the larger ones have been located. For my part, I was too weary to think. I just staggered on. A crowd of slim, darting white shapes surrounded us. They swam before us, showing the way. The five patriarchs walked majestically before us and between us, smiling at us through the thick lenses of our headpieces, walked I me. Oh, it was a triumphal procession, and had I been less weary, I presume I would have felt quite the hero. I me pictured for us as we went along the happiness, the gratefulness of her people. Already, she informed us, great numbers of young men were clearing away the bodies of the dead Rorn. She was so happy that she could hardly restrain herself. A dim skeleton shape bulked at my left. I turned to look at it, and Imee, watching me through the lights of my headpiece, nodded and smiled. Yes, this was the very hulk by which she had been swimming when the shark had attacked her. The shark which had been the cause of the accident. She darted on to show me the very rib upon which her head had struck, stunning her so that she had drifted unconscious and storm-tossed to the shore of Mercer's estate. I studied the wreck. It was battered and tilted on its beam ends, but I could still make out the high poop that marked it as a very old ship. A Spanish galleon, Mercer, I conjectured. I believe so. And then in pictured form for Imee's benefit, it has been here while much time passed? Yes, Imee came darting back to us, smiling. Since before the Timorn, my people were here. A roar we made prisoner once told us, his people discovered it first. They went into this strange skeleton, and inside were many blocks of very bright stone. She pictured quite clearly bars of dully glinting bullion. Evidently the captive had told his story well. These stones, which were so bright, the Rorn took to their city, which is three swims distant. How far that might be I could not even guess. A swim, it seemed, was the distance a Timorn could travel before the need for rest became imperative. There were many Rorn, and they each took one stone, and of them they made a house for their leader, the leader, as she pictured him, being the most hideous travesty of a thing in semi-human form that the mind could imagine, incredibly old and wrinkled and ugly and gray. His noseless face seamed with cunning, his eyes red-rimmed and terrible, his teeth gleaming white and sharp like fangs. A whole house, except the roof, she went on. It is there now, and it is gazed at with much admiration by all the Rorn. All this our prisoner told us, before we took him with a rock made fast to him, out over the place of darkness. He too was very proud of their leader's house. Treasure, I commented to Mercer. If we could find the city of Rorn, we might make the trip pay for itself. I could sense his wave of amusement. I think he replied, I'd rather stand it myself. These Rorn don't appeal to me. It was over half an hour before we were at last free of our diving suits, and the first thing Captain Bonnet said was, We've got to get to the surface, and that quickly. Our air supply is running damnably low. By the time we blow out the tanks, we'll be just about out, and foul air will keep us here until we rot. I'm sorry, sir, but that's the way matters stand. Mercer, white-faced and ill, stared at him dazedly. Air? he repeated groggily. I knew just how he felt. We should have lots of air, the specifications. But we're dealing with facts, sir, not specifications, said Captain Bonnet. Another two hours here, and we won't leave ever. Then it can't be helped, Captain, muttered Mercer. We'll go up and back for more compressed air. 
We must remember to plot our course exactly. You kept the record on the way out as I instructed you? Yes, sir, said Captain Bonnet. Just a minute, then, said Mercer. Weakly he made his way forward to the little cubbyhole in which was housed the central station of his thought telegraph. I didn't even inspect the gleaming maze of apparatus. I merely watched him dully as he plugged in an antenna similar to the one we had left with Imy and adjusted the things on his head. His eyes brightened instantly. She's still wearing her antenna, he said swiftly over his shoulder. I'll tell her that something's happened. We must leave, but that we will return. He sat there, frowning intently for a moment, and then dragged the antenna wearily from his head. He touched a switch somewhere, and several softly glowing bulbs turned slowly red and then dark. You and I, he groaned, had better go to bed. We overdid it. She understands, I think. Terribly sorry, terribly disappointed. Some sort of celebration planned, I gather. Captain Bonnet? Yes, sir. You may proceed now as you think best, said Mercer. We're retiring. Be sure and chart the course back, so we may locate this spot again. Yes, sir, said Captain Bonnet. When I awoke, we were at anchor, our deck barely awash before the deserted beach of Mercer's estate. Still feeling none too well, Mercer and I made our way to the narrow deck. Captain Bonnet was waiting for us, spruce in his blue uniform, his shoulders bowed as always. Good morning, gentlemen, he offered, smiling crisply. The open air seems good, doesn't it? It did. There was a fresh breeze blowing in from the Atlantic, and I filled my lungs gratefully. I had not realized until that instant just how foul the air below had been. Very fine, Captain, said Mercer, nodding. You have signaled the men on shore to send out a boat to take us off? Yes, sir, I believe they're launching her now. And the chart of our course, did the return trip check with the other? Perfectly, sir. Captain Bonnet reached into an inner pocket of his double-breasted coat, extracted two folded pages, and extended them with a little bow to Mercer. Just as Mercer's eager fingers touched the precious papers, however, the wind whisked them from Bonnet's grasp and whirled them into the water. Bonnet gasped and gazed after them for a split second, then barely pausing to tear off his coat, he plunged over the side. He tried desperately, but before he could reach either one of the tossing white specks, they were washed beneath the surface and disappeared. Ten minutes later, his uniform bedraggled and shapeless, he pulled himself on deck. I'm sorry, sir, he gasped out of breath. Sorrier than I can say. I tried. Mercer, white-faced and struggling with his emotions, looked down and turned away. You don't remember the bearings, I suppose, he ventured tonelessly. I'm sorry, no. Thank you, Captain, for trying so hard to recover the papers, said Mercer. You'd better change at once. The wind is sharp. The captain bowed and disappeared down the cunning tower, and then Mercer turned to me and a smile struggled for life. Well, Taylor, we helped her out anyway, he said slowly. I'm sorry that, that Imy will misunderstand when we don't come back. But Mercer, I said swiftly, perhaps we'll be able to find our way back to her. You thought before, you know, that, but I can see now what an utterly wild goose chase it would have been. Mercer shook his head slowly. No, old friend, it would be impossible, and Imy will not come again to guide us. She will think we have deserted her. And he smiled slowly up into my eyes. Perhaps it's as well. After all, the photographs and the data I wanted would do the world no practical good. We did Imy and her people a good turn. Let's content ourselves with that. I, for one, am satisfied. And I, old-timer, I said, placing my hand affectionately upon his shoulder. Here's the boat. Shall we go ashore? We did go ashore silently. And as we got out of the boat and set foot again upon the sand, we both turned and looked out across the smiling Atlantic, dancing brightly in the sun. The mighty, mysterious Atlantic, home of Imy and her people. End of Into the Ocean's Depths by Sewell Peasley Wright